Uh, welcome again, uh, Colonel Burgess. Thanks, sir. Okay. Uh, I kind of like to walk. Can you hear me okay in the back? Oh, well, thanks. Uh, so I've been told I'm here for about an hour, so this is your time. Uh, all I'm going to do is try and make sure that as I make eye contact that somebody's not taking a nap, uh, and then I'll figure out how to fix that. But uh, what I want to do is kind of put in context my, my career, uh, and then I've got a couple of talking points that they've asked me to kind of chat about. And then I'll talk about some other things, but I want to leave some time for questions, because when I talk to you about that career a little bit, uh, I want to let people ask questions, and we can talk about, since this is supposed to be in the School of Business and you know how Auburn prepared me and all that stuff, we, we can do all of that. But I've also found as I speak to audiences around the country, because of that past I'm going to describe to you a little bit, that people sometimes have something they want to ask about from a current standpoint or what's going on in the world. Uh, and we can do that uh, since I'm a, I'm a career intelligence puke, as I say. Uh, he said I was in the Army for 38 years, started out in 74 when I graduated from Auburn. Actually, first duty assignment was right here at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, I was out at Harmony Church and uh, lived over off Buena Vista Road uh, for my first assignment. Asked for Benning because my wife, the, the girl I was dating, we thought we were serious. We were. Uh, we got married after she graduated in 75, and this seemed to be, you know, the best proximity I could do. So I started out as an armor officer uh, out there and then became a career intel guy. Did the standard stuff that an army guy does uh, throughout my career up through the greater colonel. Uh, then in 1997, as I say, I left the army. I uh, became a joint kind of guy. I never went back to my basic branch uh, in terms of serving in an Army position. Uh, and so went off to be the J-2 at the Joint Special Operations Command. Uh, since I'm being taped and because I still carry all of my clearances, I don't talk about what that does. If you know what it does, great. If you don't, too bad. Uh, but uh, spent a little time on that side of the fence in terms of doing that work for a couple of years. Got promoted because I screwed up and uh, you know, moved over to be the J-2 of U.S. Southern Command. For those in the audience that don't follow, you know, we in the military divide the world up into combatant commands, and that's how we do things. I was at Southern Command, and so when people ask me what I did for a living as the Director of Intelligence for Southern Command, I tell them I did drugs. Uh, you know, because that's what we focused on for the most part. Sorry. Uh, that's what we focused on for the most part in terms of doing things. Uh, out there, but then 9-11 occurred. And so I became the father, if you will, of Guantanamo. Exec execute order, you know, love the way the, uh, the military works. Uh, 24 December of 2001, and those of you that are in the military, those of you that are former military, so how many people do you think are in a headquarters on Christmas Eve, about 1,500 in the afternoon? Not many. And that's when we got the execute order to stand up Guantanamo Bay. So, you know, we had to jump through our hoops because the first plane load of detainees arrived into Guantanamo on 11 January. And so I became uh, the focal point for what we were doing from an interrogation standpoint and how we were going to gather intel from, from folks because we weren't sure if there was going to be another attack or what else was being planned. Left there. Went off to be the J-2 or Director of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where I did what I did there for the Chairman and the Secretary. Uh, left there, you know, because we stood up this new thing in the United States of America, because remember, and now it's in the history books for y'all, but we had these two commissions in the early 2000 time frame, the 9-11 Commission and the WMD Commission, because yes, we got it wrong on WMD in Iraq, there wasn't any. And, oh, by the way, yep, we didn't predict or forecast 9-11. Remember, there's only two outcomes, or really three outcomes, uh, as you work the business side. So as I can make a connection on the, you know, there's policy success, 
there's operational success, and there's intelligence failure. It's got to be one of the three. So, you know, there, we, we, got it. we didn't tell people that 9-11 was going to occur, and we told the president that there was WMD in Iraq. So we had two commissions, because that's what we do in the United States. We take a look at ourselves, call it an after-action review, or we go back and we say, okay, why did we get this so wrong? And one of the things that came out of both of those commissions or studies was the fact that your United States intelligence community was not organized in a proper fashion. Primarily, you, the American taxpayer, pay for an intelligence community that right now unclassifies about 100,000 people wearing civilian clothes. We don't count the number of people in uniform in that. It would add to that. And it's somewhere between a 60 and $70 billion business. The number's classified totally. Uh, but that's in the ballpark in terms of what we do. But from a business standpoint, as people looked at it, and rightfully so, you had at that time 15 different entities inside that intelligence community with that amount of budget. And the person that was the nominal head of that intelligence community was the director of central intelligence. That was the title, DCI. And the DCI also wore a second hat director of CIA. Well, as you might imagine, anytime you have an organization the size and breadth and depth of the CIA, you know, that kind of is your day job. And to be expected to do that job well and run a community like I just described, the studies all said, we probably don't have this right. So hence the director of national intelligence was stood up. So I became a, I joke, I became a sacrificial lamb, one of the two military guys sent out of the department, uh, along with Mike Hayden, uh, over to the Director of National Intelligence. About, uh, about eight months later, Mike Hayden went over to be the Director of CIA, and I got a call from Ambassador Negroponte saying, hey Ron, you're gonna be the Acting Principal Deputy Director of National Intelligence. So that's the number two in the United States Intelligence Community. And I learned a valuable lesson really just had a lesson reinforced that the way Washington works. Uh, I was gonna do that job for two or three months while they searched for the right person that they wanted and then they would get that person confirmed. And finally we got the replacement unit in 22 months later. And so for almost two years I was the number two. What does that really mean and where you might wanna poke? Uh, that means that three or four mornings a week, because every morning for President Bush, and into the President Obama administration, we do a morning intel brief, whether he's here or whether he's on the road. And so three or four mornings a week, I would find myself in the Oval Office doing the brief to the President, Vice President, the National Security Advisor, and then on certain mornings, we would have other folks in, uh, Director of FBI and others like that, as we would talk about terrorist threats. Finished that job up and went off to be the Director of DIA. And for you know, basic you know, comparison pieces, director of DIA, I do for the department, I did for the Department of Defense and for the military side of the house, what the director of CIA does. So we're both spooks at the national level uh, and we both do that types of mission. But, but that's basically, in a nutshell, just in case there's something that's happened in a time span that you've always wondered about, give us your best shot. As I said, I still carry my clearances. I'll figure out how to best answer your question without making sure that I fail my next polygraph when that time comes. So I won't give up a secret if, I, if, if it is classified. So why did I do that? Well, I got graduated from Opelika High School. Honestly, I was walking down the hallway one day and the guidance counselor stopped me and said, hey Ron, somebody's gotta try for one of these ROTC scholarships. My dad had been in the post office. I didn't have a clue what the military was about. I'd grown up around the military, uh, growing up in Jacksonville, North Carolina, around Camp Lejeune. So I said, sure, because I wasn't sure I was gonna be able to go to college from a financial standpoint. So I tried for the Army, Air Force, got both of them. Air Force said, great, you got a four-year scholarship, but because of your eyeballs, you're gonna be a navigator. And I said, eh. I was young, trying to, hey, no, I'm gonna fly. And at that time, we were still wavering on eyesight for helicopters because of Vietnam. And I said, I can fly helicopters to the Army. 
by the time I graduated in 74, waivers had stopped, you know, boot. Uh, I had entered Auburn as a pre-pharmacy major, got called into the office of the professor of military science two days later after the first quarter started, we were on a quarter system, said, Burgess, the Army is not looking for regular Army pharmacists. Find a new line of work. So I went into poli sci. Seemed to work. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I uh, actually thought I'd go into military if I got selected, and I'd get out after four years, and I'd go into coaching is honestly what I thought I would do. I thought I would be a high school football coach. I walked on at Auburn, gave it up after about six weeks because I was tired of donating my body to science, as I say, <laughs> because I was a tackling dummy. And about the time I got planted for the third time that day in practice, I said, you know, this isn't as fun as it used to be. And so, you know, I focused then on, on doing what I was doing. And hence, went, in, went into for a career. So, it wasn't anything I really focused on, more providential than anything else in terms of it, in terms of how things worked out. Uh, but then through the years, you know, he mentioned Masters of Science. You know, I got a, a degree in uh, an education. No great shakes on why I selected that. Quite honestly, the way it played out, in Berlin, Germany at the time, there weren't too many schools. University of Southern California, and Boston University had the two programs. Boston had a Master of Science in Business Administration. And I said, eh, as I did my checking with friends, you know, I said, hey, does this translate? Does it like having an MBA? Eh, no, not, not the same thing. And I found out if I wanted to get that degree, it would take six more courses after I graduated to get a true MBA at that time from someone else. Uh, nah, because in the military, it came down to it doesn't matter about the degree as long as you have the pedigree. You just needed a master's degree, quite honestly. So I said, hey, education works. My wife got one. It can't be that hard. Take that off the tape. <laughs> uh, but no, so it was the only other program there. I got it. And so, but actually, to be fair, it caused me to start thinking. And, and so I became a proponent throughout my military career for education and training. And there is a difference. We won't necessarily, that's not the purpose of this talk. There's a difference between training and education in terms of that. And so, you know, as I went forward in my career, primarily working with my civilian suit workforce, while I encouraged my military folks to always do what they could to get more education you as a taxpayer, and I use myself as an example, have 38 years, had, I had 38 years in the military. But of that 38 years, you, the American taxpayer, invested almost five and a half years in me in training and education between the different courses that I went to, not only in the military, but other schooling that I did from an educational standpoint. When I look at my three-piece suit workforce, as I call my civilian workforce, we're not even close. One of the reasons we have the best military in the world, quite honestly, all the technology is great and everything else, but at the end of the day, the reason we have the best military is because of the person. Doesn't matter about the service. And part of that is because of that training and education that we invest in. And if we want the preeminent civilian workforce, in my mind, in the world, supporting that military and doing what needs to be done in this nation, we need to invest in that also. So I've continually led a charge on that throughout my military career. And it was part of the reason that I ended up coming back to Auburn at a time. Now, one of the things, you know, in that big long title that he talked about for anybody that was awake as far as what I do at Auburn, part of what I do is on the cyber side. I've been interested on the cyber side for a long time. You know, as a military guy, I can talk to you about what we do in the land domain, what we do on the sea, on the air, all that stuff. But the cyber domain is, is, is here. No longer can we say it's coming. And it hit me between the eyes. In 2007, uh, I learned uh, 
a, a really valuable lesson again that was just reinforced. And I don't say it to drop names, but uh, Mike McConnell, who was the director of national intelligence at the time, Mike and I took a briefing into the Oval Office to the president, the vice president. And it had to do with how we were having our lunch eaten in the United States on the cyber side. The lesson that I had reinforced to me is that I learned when you take a problem into the Oval Office, you generally will own it walking out. And we were told to fix it. And here we are in 2015 and we're still talking about it. What do we do? And so why is cybersecurity, why, why is it a problem? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's, let's talk first. If I were doing a classified military brief to you today, I would be talking to you about capabilities of other nations. So what's in the news right now? Well, what's in the news right now, uh, for the most part, you know, hey, look at what Russia is doing in Syria. Well, so I'd be talking to you about Russia, and I'd be talking to you about China. And let's talk about, you know, capabilities out there. Right now, my professional opinion, the best aircraft in the world right now bar none, is the US F-35. It's top of the line, it has the capabilities it needs, it does not have a peer competitor out there. But if I were doing the classified brief to you, I would be talking to you about our friends, the Russians and the Chinese, and I would be describing to you how they had on the shelf design, testing, now they've rolled it out, you can read about it. They've rolled out their fifth generation, that's what we call them, fifth generation attack fighter on both sides. But what I would also go on to tell you is that at least, and this is unclassified because I can't talk classified, in the area of 50% of those two aircraft, the technology and makeup is not indigenous to their own capabilities. That's another way of saying we gave it to them or they stole it, whatever you want to say. They took it and they used it and put it into their stuff. And that's what's happening out there on the military side. And I could talk about other capabilities that would be like that. Because if we look across the domains that are out there on the cyberspace, if I'm talking the dot mill, we're reasonably good, reasonably good at protecting what we have in the dot, dot mill. We're not 100% and we can talk about different cases where dot mill has messed it up. Dot gov, a little less than that, actually a lot less than the dot mill, but it, it's not in too bad a shape. But when I start thinking about the dot com, where we all bank in a lot of cases. When I start, and, and I'm looking at this crowd right here, and I, I mean, because I'm now at Auburn, when I look at the .edu domain, when I look at the .org domain, folks, we're in trouble. We have a problem. So let me give you a business statistic that will tie into that. So right now, and I always give my sources that are out there, uh, you heard uh, maybe three years ago, two years ago, you heard President Obama, and you heard a guy named Keith Alexander, General Keith Alexander, a friend of mine. Keith was the director of NSA and US Cyber Command. They were using a number in public when they would talk that said, you know, we're losing out the side door, we're, we're losing anywhere between $250 billion to $1 trillion a year of people taking our knowledge out of the United States. Call it intellectual property. Well, they got that number from a Mandiant, Mandiant FireEye is one of the companies that looks in the cyberspace and does assessments. Uh, Symantec is another one. Both of those had done studies that put the figure about there. You know, is it exact? No, because remember, liars figure and figures lie. It's a swag. 
And if you don't know what the acronym SWAG really stands for, you ought to, you know, stupid, wild, blank guess. Uh, but it's in the ballpark in terms of that. Uh, but here, if you then go to different business references, Barron's is the one I use as an example. If you look at the corporate makeup of the Fortune 500 companies, the general assessment from Barron's is that for our companies, that the net worth of a company, that anywhere from 30 to in some cases 80%, and it runs the gamut, 30 to 80% of the net worth of corporations is tied up in their intellectual property. The secret sauce that makes them what they are. It's not this infrastructure and all this stuff. And so Mandiant and Symantec said, that's what's going out the side door. But put that number in context, because remember, I'm a poli-sci major. I, you know, I didn't spend much time in business. I withdrew from macroeconomics because you actually had to go to class, and I wasn't up for that. So what does one trillion mean other than being a number? Last year, the GDP, the gross domestic product, and even I knew what that was as a poli-sci guy, the, the sum of all goods and services produced by this nation, the GDP of the United States of America, was around $15.5 trillion, according to the Department of Commerce. Well, if they're right, worst case, if 1 15th of our GDP went out the side door to our competitors, that does make cybersecurity a national security issue in my mind. And it's something we need to start paying attention to. But policy on this is hard. You know, how, how do we really go about doing that? And right now, companies in the United States are tired of playing rope-a-dope. Now, I'm dating myself, because that really is going back in boxing terms, in terms of what I think Muhammad Ali did. You know, as he'd sit there, you know, just get his, get his brains beat in, and then he'd come out punching after that, let the guy, other guy waste himself on it. But we're expected to just sit there and take the blows, because we don't have policy on how, how do we do? So right now the focus is on defense. Everybody's trying to defend uh, their eye. Are you going to add retinal eye scan? Are you going to add your th uh, biometrics? How far are you going with this? So everything is focused on defending the cyber space in terms of it. And at the end of the day, what it really comes down to in cyberspace it really does come down to, is my geek better than your geek? And I mean geek as an honorific in this case. That is not a derogatory term in my mind. I don't understand the ones and zeros. But the ones and zeros are getting interesting. For those of you that didn't pay attention, you know, about four years ago, we've been careful on attribution on this, but it gave us a flavor of what someone can do Iran decided they were not happy with something that Saudi Arabia had done. And so what did they do? They attacked Saudi Aramco, the big oil petroleum company for Saudi Arabia. They physically destroyed 30,000 hard drives on computers, so the computers were rendered completely useless and all data was unusable. That's what you can do in cyberspace. And so, what are we going to do when somebody does that? Because right now we've got people, other countries, not just countries, it's not just nation states, we've got criminal gangs. Uh, from the Russian side of the house, from the Chinese side of the house, uh, not just those two countries. We got people coming in to our own cyberspace planting things. You get stuff on your computer all the time that are criminal entities, not just here in the United States, but from other countries where if you click on the link and they've got you on a sphere phishing attempt, y y you don't know where that's going to go, what it's going to do. and so. Our focus from a policy standpoint up to now has been on how to defend. I do talks all the time to uh, audiences talking about 
you know, how you protect your personally identifiable information in terms of doing it. But ultimately, we're going to have to move past that. And that's where the policy piece is going to be interesting for this because corporations in the United States are tired of being pummeled in this area. And they want to respond. So what do I mean by that? Well, the easiest one for most folks to understand, I'll give you, you know, I'm an Army guy, but I'll give you an Air Force example. Right now, flying off the coast of China, pick off the coast of Syria, you know, because that's in the news. If, if a U.S. airplane is flying and another aircraft, say Russian, pick your country, it doesn't matter. But if another aircraft locks on its targeting radar, if it is locked on, that is considered a hostile act in the airspace. And under the rules, you have the right to defend yourself. You can, in fact, go after the other guy. What is the equivalent in cyberspace? We haven't defined it yet. Part of the problem is attribution. Attribution in cyberspace is tough because of the way the internet is. How do you say to a senior policymaker, to the president CEO of a company, I know that his computer at his desk is the one that sent that thing into our company. You're not real sure. But here's the bigger problem. Say we do a tribute and it's his computer, we know the location, we know the IP, we know exactly where it took place from. Problem in cyberspace is say I take a tool that I have, those weaponized ones and zeros, if you will, and I say, go, go, go take his data out. I cannot look the policy maker or decision maker in the eye right now and say, and sir, it is only going to affect that computer. Because the nature of cyberspace is this, it's all connected. I don't really know where those ones and zeros are going. We, talk, we call it collateral damage in the military. Uh, you've just seen a recent reporting on that. You know, it's sad, you know, sad city, what happened in, in Afghanistan with the hospital, you know, in terms of some of that. And so, you know, we go to very great efforts inside the military now when we put a precision munition on something, having been involved in that targeting, especially my last six years, you know, we can take one of our JDAMs and we can put it through an eight inch pane window and make sure that it hits what it's supposed to and then doing blast effect modeling and all, what the blast will do based on the type of structure it's hitting. So we can tell people this is what it will do. And oh, by the way, I haven't seen any friendlies or non-combatants in the area, so there shouldn't be any of that collateral damage. In cyberspace, we cannot do that. We can't go through that process. So, you know, cybersecurity is going to be with us here for a while in terms of that and how we're going to do that. And we as a nation need to get on with the discussion on what we're going to do, especially for those entities outside the government, because the problem is only going to keep getting worse in terms of where this is going to go. I do not see our friends backing off. And when I say friends, I mean everybody in terms of that. Because don't just focus, and I won't go any more into detail, don't just focus on those that you generally say are the bad guys, the Russians and the Chinese. Business espionage is as big a business as anything else going on out there. And it is always trying to find out what somebody else is thinking. So, you know, at Auburn, we're working on programs we are one of 18 schools, so in the cyberspace, looking at educational institutions, there's, there's what I call the good housekeeping seal of approval. So right now, there's about 140 universities and colleges in the United States that have a specific designation called the Center of Academic Excellence that's given by the Department of Homeland Security and NSA, the National Security Agency, in cyber education. There's about 75 to 80 schools 
that have a designation that is also DHS, Department of Homeland Security, and National Security Agency, in workforce development in cyber. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm standing up here, those phrases are just rolling off my you know, tongue. I didn't, I, I didn't know what some of this stuff was you know, when I came into academia. You know, I didn't even know what a consortium was and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's new language to me, you know, uh, being a military guy. But then there's the last designation that is just given by NSA only, the National Security Agency, and it's the Center of Academic Excellence, and it's in cyber operations, and it really is the ones and the zeros, how they perform, where they go, how you can manipulate, what do you do offensively and defensively. And there's only 18 schools in the United States that have that designation, and Auburn is one of those because I think it is imp important for us to be preparing our people for the future. You know, we already know, DOD's already said that in the next five years they need 6,000 cyber warriors, and I know that they're having trouble getting those because we're having trouble retaining those that we have because once you get that skill set, a lot of people want you to come work for them, so we need 6,000. Numbers vary depending, again, on which study you want to look at from an industry side. Generally speaking, the numbers run anywhere from 30 to 100,000 at the worst case over the next 10 years of cyber warriors that business and people in the United States are going to need. So it's a brave new world for those that are interested on that side of the house in terms of doing some of that. So. That's kind of where we're going. I mean, you know, you have to decide, as I think, you know, in, in my case, I'll finish up with this and we'll see if people want to start asking questions or what you might want to talk about. You know, I, I speak to a lot of audiences from a college, uh, university standpoint where I'm speaking to students. Uh, and I've already kind of told you my, my vein on this. You know, in, in my case, uh, I wish I could tell you that I focused early on in my life to do a certain thing and go in a particular direction. That's not the way things played out uh, for me. Uh, but I, I have two things that I really have caught on to in addition to what I did in my military career. The, the cyber piece, which I think is important for us as a nation uh, in terms of that, and also the importance of the training and the education, again, recognizing the difference in those two. And it is more than just getting the pedigree, uh, saying you're doing it. Uh, because, you know, in, in the military, I went, to, I went to a school in the mid-80s. Name is not necessarily important, it's called SAMS, the School of Advanced Military Studies. And basically, it's the second you spend two years out at Fort Leavenworth, not in the disciplinary barracks or the penitentiary, which some people equate to, to Leavenworth. You're actually out there studying the first years for Command and General Staff College. But the second year is actually a very select group of officers that get to stay and study. And I committed myself to saying, you know, if I'm going to be in this military for a while, I need to be the best military person I can and focus on that. Where's the challenge, though, as I sit here and look at the students here? It was part of the challenge I faced as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, in, in my workforce. You know, with my, I had 18,000 people uh, inside the DIA uh, that worked for me. 45% of those uh, folks were military and 55% of those people were civilian in terms of that. But the biggest problem for me as an agency head and being a leader in the intelligence community is you know, I, I've stopped trying to figure out what the name is for young people today. X, Y, Gen, whatever, you know, hey, whatever, millennia, I got it, whatever, we're something, you know. But all the, you know, if I believe the demographers of the world, world and all the people that came in to brief me all the time, unlike those of us that have a little gray hair in the room, uh, and some don't even have hair, and I won't call you out. Uh, but the older folks in the room, where older folks generationally committed to a career, 
we're being told now that y'all are going to have anywhere between six and nine careers during a 30-year career. You're not as wed to an organization uh, and a line of work. Uh, you know, we certainly understand that you're certainly much more uh, savvy on the IT side of the house, you know, you grew up with it, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch the kids now as they move through some of this stuff and how they can do that. You know, the, the demographers tell us that you, I think the phrase is, you crave interaction on social media. Okay, shut up. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. I love technology. Uh, but, you know, so, in, in that vein, you're looking at the Neanderthal in the, in, in the room, and I mean that. So that social media piece, I, uh, you know, I talked to you about the cyber piece. So I'm, I don't know that I'm the only person in the room, but I might be the only person that does it for the reasons I do it. Uh, so others don't because they don't understand how to do it. But, but I, I don't have a Facebook account. I don't Twitter, I do not join LinkedIn, because you can believe all you want to that there is no way that folks can get inside. If you haven't read the recent report that just came out in the last week about how a Twitter account was used to hack into a bank account, folks, you don't know where the stuff is going from the ones and zeros side of the house. I am not saying that you have to live in a castle with a moat around you like I do, okay? I am saying you have to be careful in terms of this. So as an example, right now everything requires passwords. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's my banking, whether it's my, you know, Delta stuff, whether it's my life insurance, that my work, you know, Auburn University, my, you know, 401, or Hama Hama, everything requires passwords. How do I do it? Well, first of all, if I print my passwords out right now for those accounts, I have about five pages, typewriter, you know, with a space in between, but about five pages of different passwords. Nothing is repetitive. If I'm gonna use a password, I go online, and there are tools online where you can type in, you've seen it when you, and you can find out the strength of your password. Is it weak, moderate, strong? Really strong. And I don't store my passwords anywhere. Mine are kept on a, on a thumb drive that I have locked up in a safe at my house. Now, again, I am anal about this because I think that's, that's what's required. So last year, according to the Department of Justice, 52% of the American population had some form or fashion of its personally identifiable information taken. That's, that number is not inconsequential. The numbers are always staggering when you look out there, you know, in terms of who's had the latest data breach. You know, it's always, you know, everybody's aware of the Target, what happened with Target. You know, I don't personally shop at Neiman Marcus, but, you know, even Neiman Marcus got hit, you know, for those that are really in the upper echelons of shopping online. Uh, OPM. You know, we started out saying the number was about 5 million Americans, then the number moved to 25 million, and I will tell you that we haven't released the last number yet of people that had their Social Security number. So, folks, it is what it is out there. And again, you can't, you, you cannot be totally focused inward. I'm just saying you've got to be careful in terms of how you operate in that space uh, because, you know, we're, we're still learning about some of it, and I think we're going to be learning about it for a while. So with that, let me shut up. What do you want to talk about?
this morning? What do you want to poke on? Or we can, you know, take a break and go to lunch because it's your time. I'm here as entertainment. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't a joke. I mean, so in for so I still, as I said, I carry my clearances, and so uh, it's a requirement uh, for us. The the rule reads that you are subject to a polygraph, uh, and so I've had three polygraphs in my lifetime, been hooked up to the machine, you know, and you know, first one was kind of interesting. Because, you know, and, and honestly, because, you know, I, I have learned that I don't think a polygraph is the end all to be all. And honest people have problems with, with it because, you know, some people refer to it as the Catholic mentality. You feel guilty about something that's really not that bad or, or whatever. And so you cause the machine to ping. But we use it as a deterrent. And I think that's exactly what it is. So, but I think where companies are going to go. And where I recommend, and so, you know, in this new life I live now as a retired guy, uh, I sit on a lot of boards. I'm chairman of the board of two companies uh, on things. And so I talked about, you know, how we're trying to defend cyber and how we defend. I'm also telling companies, you know, you got to pay attention to the insider threat. Uh, I'm all for, you know, we can have a discussion because. Americans have different points of views on this. Uh, I, I had no problem. I mean, I had a rule. So you would think at DIA, you know, hey, they're great Americans. They really were. People trying to do the best job they could. But people are human beings. And so, you know, as I call it, you know, one of the things that I allowed to stay when I came in to be the beloved director is, you know, I said, okay, if people are working inside their, their cubicle, working at their computer, we did not have internet at all the workstations, you know, because we were a classified environment. You know, we wanted to protect and make sure nobody had a problem with that. We also, it was supposed to be policy that DVD and CD-ROMs were disabled so that someone couldn't copy stuff and take them out of the building. Okay, guess what? Murphy's always alive and well and working out there. You know, IT shops, don't always, you know, you say this is what it's supposed to be, Jiminy Christmas, something happened, one slips through, got it. But the one thing we allowed, which we were the only one inside the uh, Intel community to allow, because, you know, I wanted to take care of my workforce, I agreed, I said, look, if somebody wants to sit in the cubicle and, you know, be sitting there rocking out to their iPod, go right ahead. Whatever turns you on, I don't care. But you will not, will not, download from iTunes or any place else the latest, greatest craze for the song that day because you want to add to your library. Well, loaded up a tool. I stood there the day, stood inside the command center, and they flipped it on for me. And I'm standing there with my DIA police force, and I became the proud new owner of 63 brand new iPods because People are people. Were they mal? No, they, they weren't. You know, they weren't downloading it. But rules are rules, and so insider threat is an issue. So, I had the capability to monitor every keystroke one of my people did on a computer. Download. I had the ability to monitor, and I tried to continually improve that because you, as the American taxpayer, ought to require me to do that to protect secrets. We spend a lot of money for that intelligence community. We ought to do it right. I don't think it has a problem with privacy. What else? Ma'am. Um, what's your thoughts on the Secretary of State having their own email system and having their own email system and having their own I will keep this completely apolitical. That is dumber than dirt. There is no way that she should have been allowed to have a private server. By rule, and I'm sorry I disagree with any talking head, you do not, and so right now, I, I carry two phones. I did on active duty also. 
This is one that I pay for with AT&T, and this is one Auburn University provides now, but I had one that DIA provided, DN and the DNI provided. This one's to be used to conduct business with. I don't get to have this one and conduct business with it and say it's off limits. Uh, it was wrong. It should not have been allowed, in, in my professional opinion. And to say that I didn't know they were classified, I'll leave it at that. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> She's the Secretary of State. If she doesn't know what's classified, we got a bigger problem. I'll let it go with that. That that you know, that's that's a subject that I have a real problem with. It, but not just her, anyone. I mean, I tell the story all the time. Sometimes we are cavalier. Not not malintentioned in some cases. It's you know, again, we're human beings. So in the late nineties. We had a member of the administration, for whatever reason, we had been aware from the bombings in Africa, uh, go back and check, because sometimes I know I'm getting old now, so everybody doesn't remember you know, some things. Go back and check at the two US embassies that were bombed in Africa in the late 90s, okay, in 98 to be specific. We had a member of the administration, not the president, I'll at least say that, but stand up in a news conference and say, we've got bin Laden on his Thariah telephone. It's a, it's a satellite, SATCOM, that you know, allows you to be in the middle of nowhere and talk, you know, but it's called a Thariah telephone. From that day forward, we never had bin Laden again on a signals intercept. The enemy's not stupid. So when we take a tool out of the toolbox and reveal it and say, because we live in a free and open society, I've only got so many tools. And every time somebody reveals one of them, the enemy adapts. And so, you know, when people do stuff like that, it makes it harder. It, it, it's, you know, if, if we're comfortable, if we're okay with that, great. I don't happen to be comfortable with it because I was charged with protecting the United States, and I don't wrap myself in the flag on that. I just wish more people would pay attention. Sir. Cadet Holmes, when it comes cool. to integration. Nice haircut. Thank you. When it comes to integration in PII, do you think the consumers or either the large corporations would be able to take so much emphasis off those zeros and ones because it seems like it's the root of a lot of attacks? Right. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's interesting. Uh, here in the last eight months, you know, I, I love when I see articles on this from time to time. Yeah, I guess we add words to the American language all the time. Uh, you know, I just hadn't paid attention being in the military. But, but now we're told that Americans are suffering from data breach fatigue. We're tired of, Amer we're tired of hearing about it because it happens all the time. And it is happening all the time. So people are just getting tired of, of, of dealing with it and just saying, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can, but, you know, if it happens, it happens, and gee, I'll take the two-year free, you know, monitoring of my credit and all that other stuff, whatever, whatever somebody's going to give you. Uh, but I think the more interconnected the world becomes in terms of some of this, uh, it's going to cause us to pay attention. Let me give you a military example just to show you how our adversaries are thinking, because we declassified this in 2010. Not going to say it, 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 was, it was just interesting. One of the things we do in the military, and I know I've got a lot of former military, you know, one of the things we do in the military is we train, and we practice, we rehearse. We do that all the time. We run war games, because that's what militaries do. All militaries do that, if they're any good. And so we do the same thing. And so the Chinese were running a war game. What was the scenario? Typical scenario. Taiwan had misbehaved and the Chinese were going to whack them. You know, just, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to send you a message here. So Taiwan, you'll stop it. Well, OK. What was interesting, and I'm always careful when I'm giving a talk, and especially since I'm being recorded, I am not saying whether they can do this. I'm just saying 
it gives us an indication of how they think. What did the Chinese do as they whacked Taiwan? They did two things that we found very interesting that were in addition to sending their forces in against Taiwan. What they did in the asymmetric space. They, right or wrong, had identified two critical nodes because they want to keep the United States at bay. And how do they keep the United States from engaging? They identified McCord Air Force Base, Fort Lewis, as the departure base for the West Coast to bring forces to the Pacific. And so they did a electrical power grid attack because your power grid is in fact run by computers. They took the power grid down and they did a computer network attack on the command and control structure of McCord Air Force Base and Fort Lewis. Again, I'm not saying whether they could do it. It just gives us an indication of how they did it. Because in the war game, of course, for them, it worked. And they took, them, they, they, they took it down, and it allowed them freedom of maneuver. And the other place was US Transcom at Scott Air Force Base, which is our combatant command that deploys everybody all around the world. They did the same thing. They took it down from an electrical power grid, and they did a computer network attack. Interesting on how they you know, thought. Is that in the art of the possible? Yes, it is. Today it's in the art of the possible and should concern us across. So we in the United States have identified 17 critical infrastructures out there. Transportation, financial, water, all of it. How many read the report, saw the report in the news a couple of months ago about the Jeep that got hacked? Folks, guess what? Anything's possible. The other place was U.S. Transcom at Scott Air Force Base, which is our combatant command that deploys everybody all around the world. They did the same thing. They took it down from an electrical power grid, and they did a computer network attack. Interesting on how they you know, thought. Is that in the art of the possible? Yes, it is. Today it's in the art of the possible, and should concern us across. So we in the United States have identified 17 critical infrastructures out there. Transportation, financial, water, all of it. How many read the report, saw the report in the news a couple of months ago about the Jeep that got hacked? Folks, guess what? Anything's possible. What else? Sir? With regards to what you talked about earlier, about... Um, uh, that, that was about 30 minutes worth. What? No. With the, the gap between the generations, um, at one point you have Oh, absolutely, ab absolutely. I mean, so clearly. So you know, I led the charge at, at Auburn because uh, it, it, it was pretty easy for me to think of it as the military. Uh, every person at Auburn, because every person that touches .edu undergoes cyber training at Auburn University. Now, to be fair, we were at 100% on faculty. But I had to get the provost involved with some of the faculty, because I've learned faculty kind of, you know, hey, it is, it is what it is. Uh, and I'm not faculty. Uh, students, know the whole matter. We only ended up with about 65% of the students, you know, jumping up, and 100% of staff uh, piece. So, you know, I, I think that is, is really important in terms of doing that. And I'm now advocating for refresher training because, you know, that was the way I was raised. Uh, because we all become, all of us become comfortable. And is that going to be the thing that saves everything? Absolutely not. But you got to start somewhere. And you got to figure out how it is you're going to do it in terms of it. Uh, 
because at the end of the day, I think human nature is going to take over. And so, and then we start getting into the discussion, do you really want the machine thinking for you? Uh, I, you know, I am not going to go Orwellian on you here all of a sudden, but you, you, you know, we have to think about that and see where we want it to go. That's the advantage of living in the United States of America. Sir. Well, so you know, a lot of my friends, for example, uh, believe that passwords will be out in two years. Uh, and that's, that comes from some very reputable companies out there right now and inside the Department of Defense, talking to the CIO for DOD. I, I don't know that we'll get past that. I, I personally think right now two-factor authentication is the right way to be going. Uh, so I actually am moving toward pushing for not only, you know, for the password side of the house, but going for the retinal scan and the fingerprint uh, to get into that. And then, depending on where you're working, even whether it be on the govy side or whether it be in commercial industry, you know, just because you have that, that doesn't get you access to everything. There still has to be pieces and parts that require something else, whatever that's going to be out there. But again, you're talking to the Neanderthal. What else? I think we have time for one more question. Jiminy, Christmas, time flies when you're having fun. Oh, come on. Sir, you want to talk Auburn football? No. Okay, good. Not a good topic right now. <laughs> Yeah, so I think right now where the industry is, and you know, part of my problem is I will admit up front, you are not looking at a Jules Verne kind of guy. I mean, the reason I had a problem as an Intel guy, you know, I still remember getting asked to do the product, you know, what will Russian and Chinese capabilities be like in 20 years? <laughs> you know, cripes. I mean, okay, Jiminy Christmas, they'll be firing at us from the moon. I don't know. Uh, so, but I think given the current state in terms of things, I'm personally, I think things, whether we want them to or not, people are, go, are going to the cloud. I, I personally would, you know, would not, but I, I think we're all going to be forced to go to the cloud, especially in the .edu domain and especially in the development world, because you got to let people get to your stuff, so you can't lock it up. So it's going to be in the cloud. I'm all for securing entry into the cloud, exiting, and my data that I put into the cloud, encrypting going in, decrypting coming out. So I've at least got four protections going in. And if somebody can think of something else that right now is technologically available, put that in there too, depending on the sensitivity of it. But I don't think you can overdo it. The concern, especially from you talk about the young developers and you, you know, it's in a .edu, is people are always going to want to have the ability to collaborate. And how can they do that? They don't mind a little bit of pain, but they don't want it to be so painful that it causes the whole thing to fall apart. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. <laughs>